mycobacterium. So they grow slow. There are other slow growing mycobacterial species. They are not as common, but you can see them, particularly in patients who are immune compromised. So this was a patient who had advanced AIDS who died of disseminated mycobacterium avium, so almost like a bird type of tuberculosis. 27 year old man who presented in October of 1985, two week history of basically trouble breathing and a non-productive cough. Pneumocystis was detected in a lavage and serology confirmed that the patient had HIV. So we're not in pneumocystis yet because we're not in fungi, um, but pneumocystis is a fungal infection that is pretty much the signature hallmark of HIV that has progressed to AIDS. It is such a weird infection that literally you don't get unless you have AIDS. So of course that confirmed that he, they confirmed that he had an HIV infection. Uh, he was successfully treated um, with some drugs. He remained stable until May of 1987 when he showed up again with a fever and trouble breathing. Severe substernal, so below the sternum chest pain um, and pericardial friction rub. He echocardiogram revealed basically like fluids. The patient left the hospital against medical advice but returned a week later with a persistent cough, fever, pain in the chest and left arm. Um, they basically looked at his pericardium. Uh, they pulled out fluid from the pericardial um, area. And they suspected that he had tuberculos tuberculous, like tuberculosis, pericarditis, and they started antimicrobacterial anti therapy. That's hard to say when you say antimicrobial a lot, antimicrobacterial, so antimycobacterium treatment. However, over the next three weeks, he developed progressive cardiac failure and died. And it wasn't tuberculosis, it was mycobacterium uh, avium instead that they found in the pericardial fluids. Basically, right, you know, the heart is surrounded by the pericardium and there can be fluid in there. Shouldn't be too much because the heart does need to move. Um, but he had a lot of fluid in there and it did uh, turn positive for a mycobacterial species. Autopsy culture of the pericardium, spleen, liver, adrenal glands, kidneys, small intestine, lymph nodes, and pituitary gland. It was everywhere is, is basically what we're looking at. Although mycobacterium avium pericarditis is unusual, the extensive dissemination of mycobacteria in patients with advanced AIDS was common before azithromycin prophylaxis became widely used. So patients who have HIV now take a lot of prophylactic drugs to help them, uh, one, to help stop the progression of HIV, um, but sometimes to also stop the progression of different infections. Okay. Uh, we also have fast growing mycobacterial species. Um, they, well, they just replicate faster. Uh, generally, they rarely cause disease. However, um, they can be introduced by trauma or by medical treatment. And they are resistant to most anti-mycobacterials. So again, there are a couple of classes of drugs that work very well against the slow growing mycobacterium. They don't work as well against the fast growing. But because they are fast growing, you can sometimes use other antimicrobial compounds to treat them. So again, they're not terribly common. Um, but, I hate this one, but I love it anyway, uh, mycobacterial infections associated with nail salons. Oh, so a physician reported to the California Department of Health four female patients who developed lower extremity, basically big boils all over their legs, is what that means. Uh, each patient presented with originally small red papules that became large, tender, uh, boils, little red bumps, got big gooey bumps, okay, big, big gooey bumps. Bacterial cultures of the lesions were negative, but patients and patients failed uh, standard antibacterial therapy. All of the patients had visited the same nail salon. As a result of the investigation of the nail salon, a total of 110 patients were identified. Uh, one of the fast growing species of um, mycobacterial uh, infection was isolated from the lesions of 32 patients as well as the foot baths. 
So when you're going to get your pedicure, so from the foot baths, used by the patients before their pedicures, shaving the legs was identified as a risk factor for disease. When you shave your legs, if you are a person who shaves your legs, one, you can introduce nicks. I think we've all been there. If you've shaved anything, face, legs, whatever, you sometimes get cuts. But also, you know, you're kind of chopping off the hair right, right there at the skin, and that can allow bacteria to get into the hair follicle area as well. So who cares, right? You put your feet in. They're going to rub your calves. If your calves are a little hairy, let them be hairy. Right? They can deal with it. Don't shave your legs before you go get a pedicure at least 48 to 72 hours in advance. Similar outbreaks have been reported in the literature, uh, which illustrates the risks associated with contamination of waters with uh, rapidly growing mycobacteria, the difficulties of confirming these infections by routine bacterial cultures, which are typically only incubated for one to two days, and the need for effective antibiotic therapy. I still get pedicures. Yes. You shouldn't. Yeah. Yeah, they, if your skin is all intact, they can't get in. But shaving can introduce a lot of, but if you have a cut already and you go, it's the same thing. It could still get infected. So you would only want to go get a pedicure where you're, like if, if you go to like a single person and they don't do the foot bath and they just do your nails, like that's totally fine. But if you go to the place where you put them in the foot bath and everybody else has been in the same foot bath, don't have shaved your legs recently and don't go if you have a cut. Just cancel your appointment. Go later. Yeah. Apparently I was talking to my, my nail girl and I was like, cause I go to just a, a person now cause I'm paranoid. Um, and I was like, you know, they teach you that, right? When they teach you how to do nails. Oh yeah. She was, Most of the girls don't care. I'm like, what? So. At least about a week. The slow growing are like three to four weeks. Yeah. So not like, not fast in terms of fast, but fast in terms of mycobacterium fast. So they only got a few positive cultures because they... Yeah, about a third of the, cult, about a third of the patients had a positive culture because they, fi they probably finally suspected that it was that and started letting the cultures incubate longer. But typically when you see a patient that has boils, your brain is going to think it's staph. Because it's all, boils is just like a big, um, like a giant pimple, like a huge infection. Um, and you're, you're typically going to think that's a staph infection on a patient, so they'll probably look for staph um, instead of look for mycobacterium. So I, like, ideally they grow the cultures for like two days and then just throw them out if they don't grow anything after that? Basically, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the next genus that can sometimes cause human infections is nocardia. Um, it's pretty rare. It's even more rare than some of the mycobacterial in, uh, infections. They are also aerobic. Um, they are acid fast, right? They are in that same type of group. They have shorter length mycolic acids. So they are what they call weakly acid fast. Um, a little bit later, we talk about a group of bacteria called the actinomyces that simil they look very similar under the microscope. They have these like branched filaments. Um, so much so that these actinomyces are actually bacteria, but because of the way they look under the microscope, people thought they were fungi for a long time. So this actually is a suffix meaning fungus. So it's a bacterium, but it looks a lot morpho morphologically like a fungus. But these nocardia are acid fast. So if you stain them properly, um, the actinomyces are gram positive. So the colonies can also look fungal, right? Because they form these filaments. So they're very, very unique looking. Um, a lot like mycobacterium, the genus mycobacterium, these can also avoid being killed uh, by phagocytes. They have superoxide dismutase, which is an enzyme to help them um, break down superoxide radicals that are produced by the immune system. They also have catalase to help them break down uh, hydrogen peroxide. And just like mycobacterium, they can replicate inside uh, the phagolysosome. Or I'm sorry, inside the macrophage because they escape the phagolysosome. 
These are considered exogenous infections. That means that nocardia is not a normal resident of the microbiome. So if we say that something is an endogenous infection, E-N-D-O, endogenous, that means that it was probably a microorganism that you had on your body that was able to make you sick. So a lot of staph infections, right? Normal like staph infections, a lot of urinary tract infections are because of your own fecal bacteria that got in your urinary tract. But exogenous means it had to come from an outside source. And these are even um, more rare in healthy individuals. You typically will only see a nocardia infection in somebody who's immune compromised. Um, and the typical manifestation is either going to be a cutaneous or a respiratory infection. So nocardia can cause pulmonary disease, um, lung abscesses, just like we see with tuberculosis, uh, but you can also see primary or secondary cutaneous infections um, in the lymphatic system. It can get a little bit deeper in form like cellulitis or subcutaneous abscesses, and it can get into the central nervous system, but that's typically secondary. So an untreated um, respiratory infection or if it has gone subcutaneous and eventually travels to the brain, it can cause meningitis and brain abscesses. And so what you're looking at in this patient is cutaneous nocardia infection. So it causes um, a pretty gross looking infection. So this is a case of disseminated uh, nocardia infection, a 63 year old man who received a liver transplant for liver cirrhosis caused by hepatitis C. Again, a liver transplant, any major organ transplant like that, the patient will be on immunosuppressive drugs. Um, so this is an immune compromised patient. Um, at which time, so it had been four months, returned to the hospital with fever and lower leg pain. Chest x-ray was normal. Ultrasound revealed an abscess in the muscle. Uh, poorly staining gram positive rods were observed in the gram stain of pus aspirated from the abscess. So their mycolic acids are a little bit shorter. So sometimes you can do a gram stain, um, but they have a very thin layer of peptidoglycan. So they won't stain like really that deep, vibrant purple. Uh, Boom, gram stain of the pus. Nocardia grew after three days of incubation, so it grows faster than the mycobacterial species. Uh, treatment with imipenem, that's a cell wall inhibitor, was started. However, the patient developed convulsions 10 days later and partial left-sided paralysis. Next steps, of course, look at the brain. There were lesions in the brain, so the patient has brain abscesses forming. Uh, treatment was switched to more powerful antibiotics and it was combined antibiotic therapy. The subcutaneous abscesses, so like those in the muscle and in the brain gradually improved. The patient was discharged after 55 days of hospitalization. So it's a long time for an infection. The patient illustrates the propensity for nocardia to infect immunocompromised patients and to disseminate to the brain. The slow rate of growth of the organism and culture three days is considered relatively slow. The majority of infectious bacteria replicate on a plate, you see them in one day. Uh, so the slow rate of growth in culture and the need for prolonged treatment. And so these are some of the treatment options, various um, second and third generation antibiotics. So more powerful antibiotics. Okay, questions about the acid fast bacteria? No. Okay. so. What I'd like for you to do now is get in groups of, well, get in like maybe three groups and answer some questions uh, related to a couple of the topics we have already talked about. So it's a case study. Um, somebody can take notes. You can either email it to me or write it down on paper. Just make sure everybody's name who's here gets on that piece of paper. A 35 year old man was hospitalized because of headache, fever, and confusion. He had received a kidney transplant seven months earlier, after which he was given immunosuppressive drugs to prevent organ rejection. Cerebrospinal fluid was collected, which revealed white blood cells in the CSF. That's not usually great. 96% uh, leukocytes, glucose concentration of 40 milligrams per deciliter and a protein concentration. 
uh, it, there's something going on in his cerebrospinal fluid is basically what we're looking at. A gram stain of the uh, cerebrospinal fluid was negative for organisms, but gram positive cocobacilli grew in cultures of the blood and CSF. So remember a cocobacillus is a short rod. So not a real long rod, more of a short rod. So based on the case, what is the most likely cause of the patient's meningitis? What are the potential sources of this organism? And what virulence factors are associated with this organism? So we'll go ahead and take five minutes, well, like five and a half. At 12.25, we'll come back as a group and talk about it. So take time in your group to answer these questions. If it ends up being two groups, that's fine too. I don't care. Two to three groups. Just make sure everybody's name who's here gets on, gets on the document that comes to me. Are you asking me or each other? Oh. I don't see any respiratory problems. About three more minutes. No pressure, it's fine. I just want you to think about it. It's okay if you're wrong. Source of this people environment. Mm -hmm. The mm -hmm. 
Calm down, girl. <laughs> One minute. Y'all are going to be very nervous doctors right at first. <laughs> oh my God. You'll be all right. You'll figure it out. is the most likely cause of this patient's meningitis. Listeria monocytogenes. Yep, Listeria monocytogenes. So the other option is a cacobacillus that we've talked about is Corneobacterium diphtheriae, which is not typically associated with meningitis, particularly um, without a respiratory infection. So Cornibacterium diphtheriae is a respiratory pathogen. Um, and you likely, um, if you even were experiencing neurologic complications, you may not even be able to culture the organism from blood or CSF because it's mostly mediated by toxins. So those could help you kind of eliminate um, diphtheria as the cause and lean towards listeriosis instead. Perfect. Oh, where do people get listeria infections? So, from the fecal, so it's like, I guess it's like part of our microbiome? Mm, not, not usually our own microbiome, but yes, fecal contamination often from animals. Oh. So, it's going to be contaminated foods. Um, so, like the one with cantaloupe was uh, like, because the soil was contaminated with the bacterium. Uh, also, unpasteurized dairy products. So you might remember on Wednesday, Dr. Tao's class came into lab and they were doing some stuff. And one of the things they were doing was they were trying to culture listeria from unpasteurized um, milk that they bought at Sprouts. Well, actually bought it at Sprouts. So I said, if you get some, let us see it. So we'll see on Monday if they got any listeria from the uh, raw milk at, at Sprouts. Okay. Great. What virulence factors are associated? And they're doing salmonella from the chicken, too. So I was like, I was like they're selling raw milk at Sprouts? <laughs> oh, they sell raw milk at Sprouts. Yeah, and then they bought some, like, chicken and are doing salmonella. And I was like, I could have just given you one of my chicken eggs. I have chickens, too, but that's fine. What virulence factors do we see with listeria? What are some of them? What's a big one? What does listeria do that's pretty unique compared to some of the other bacteria we've talked about? It breaks apart the phagolysosome, so it's got a lot of immune evasion. Um, and then what does it do once it's broken apart the phagolysosome? That's very like Listeria classic. It pushes into the neighbors, right? It, re it can rearrange the cell wall um, and push from one cell into the no another, so it can spread from cell to cell to cell without ever having to leave and be exposed to the immune system. So those are the really like classic virulence factors that we see, okay? Questions about listeriosis or acid fast bacteria? Yes. So, if that question came up on exam, like, what's something special about listeria like, that I can move out from the cell? If you were to just name PRFM, the positive regulatory factor that allows you to do that, would that give credit? Uh, it would probably be partial credit because you're telling me it has a regulatory protein, but you doesn't, you're not telling me like, what is so special about that regulatory protein. So, like, lots of bacteria have, like, uh, regulatory proteins, like, staph has the um, AGR. Uh, no, because that, that's not, like, that's not really the virulence factor. That's a regulator. 
So if I'm asking like, what is the virulence factor that's so unique, I'm looking for like the immune evasion because of spreading from cell to cell. You could say that it's regulated by PRFA for sure, but yeah. So what I look for is that you understand why each of these bacteria is special and unique. In terms of like their genetics, if we were talking about like a microbial genetics class, definitely I would be more interested in that. But here I'm looking for how is it causing disease? Why are patients not able to clear it? Um, you know, what does infection look like? How do you tell the difference? So those are the things that are really important for you to understand. It's a good question. Other questions? Before we move on, I believe Niceria is next. Okay, uh, before you leave, just turn those in. No rush to get them in right now. Um, just make sure everybody's got their name on it. I'm, and let me triple check. I was pretty sure that I uploaded all of these. Unlike, I didn't. I have my moments. I'm like, they've been done forever. Oh, I did. I uploaded Neisseria and Haemophilus are uploaded under the week of September 11th module. I, f I, was, I was on my game. Yes. Okay. So Neisseria is a really cool genus. And we are maybe going to see if some of you carry Neisseria in your throat, um, because that's what we are looking for on the chocolate auger. So Neisseria, one of the really classic clinical factors of Neisseria, or not clinical factors, but um, things you can see actually in the lab, not necessarily causing disease, um, is that it is one of the few gram-negative caucus-shaped organism. So typically, if you had told me, I did a gram stain and I have gram negative caucus, like in bacteriology, I'd be like, ooh, you might want to try a gram stain again, because we only gave you gram positive caucus. Um, but Neisseria is one of the genera that is gram negative caucus, and they tend to be in a paired form. So we call them diplococcus under the microscope. So that's a key feature. Um, if you do, an, if, and that's why we really want you to be able to do a gram stain. Those of you going to work like in a clinical lab, you do, say somebody's got meningitis, you do a gram stain at the CSF, and you know you're good at gram stains, and you see gram negative caucus, they have Neisseria meningitis, and you can tell that to the, to the physician. They're generally members of this genus are both oxidase positive and catalase positive. So you could do a couple different biochemical tests for them. Um, and remember, these are great biochemical tests. I like these two because they're fast. You don't have to incubate them overnight and see a color change, right? You add a reagent, you see the color change right away. You add a reagent, you see bubbles right away. So they're fast biochemical tests. Um, Neisseria meningitis will generally grow on blood auger, um, but chocolate auger is better. Uh, Neisseria gonorrhea will grow on chocolate auger, usually not blood. You have to have enriched chocolate auger. They lack a couple of um, biochemical pathways, so it's helpful for them to get those nutrients from the host. So Neisseria meningitis, we're going to be doing this right next Wednesday. If you have growth on your chocolate auger, you're going to add the reagent that will turn purple if your bacteria is oxidase positive. Um, so what does that mean? What is the oxidase test looking for? What enzyme are we looking for with the oxidase test? Yep, cytochrome C oxidase. Um, and then Neisseria meningitis would also be catalase positive, and we've talked about the catalase test uh, a number of different times. So the first um, member of this genus, though, that we'll really talk about in a little bit more detail is Neisseria gonorrhea, which is the causative agent of gonorrhea. It has a lot of different virulence factors. Um, it's able to attach, and so you can see it has a protein that allows for attachment to non-ciliated human cells. This is why we typically don't see gonorrhea as a respiratory infection, because the cells lining the respiratory tract are generally ciliated. 
Um, so it can, but we do see it, it can attach to, for example, the epithelium of the vagina, it can move up into the reproductive tract, so like the fallopian tube, uh, and in the buccal cavity, in the mouth. So people can get manifestations of gonorrhea in those areas of the body. That also helps to interfere with being killed by neutrophils. Um, it has proteins to prevent phagolysosome fusion, so it can survive inside of a cell. It has additional proteins to help with attachment. It can hide it, some of its surface antigens from bacterial cytal antibodies. So it can basically coat itself and mask and hide from the immune system. It can steal iron. Uh, it has IgA protease. Um, it says the role in virulence is unknown, but in secretions, like in the mouth and in the reproductive tract, you do have IgA. So being able to break that down probably helps. It has beta lactamase. So you wouldn't want to treat it with penicillin because it can break down penicillin. Um, at least some strains. But this is uh, one of the features that's kind of unique. Instead of lipopolysaccharide, it has what we call lipooligosaccharide. So the LPS is shorter, right? It's not a polysaccharide, it's an oligosaccharide. But it still does have endotoxin activity. No. Um, cephalos well, cephalosporins are cell wall inhibitors, but penicillin is like penicillin. Um, and so, so, and so do the imipenems, like all the carbapenems. The beta lactamases work specifically against the beta lactam ring of penicillin, but there are other, like there's metallo beta lactamases that will cleave the beta lactam ring found in carbapenems, for example. So it's a slightly different enzyme to target the slightly different ring structure. So it's the beta lactam ring, but it can be modified in such a way that that enzyme won't work against maybe cephalosporin or the carbapenems, but there are bacterial strains that have enzymes that will break down those particular rings too. So is it to the point where it only affects penicillin or other cells? Uh, it will do, penicillin and like the closely related derivatives. So it might be like penicillin and ampicillin or penicillin and amoxicillin. But then when you get to maybe even like oxacillin or methicillin, it might not work. So it depends on um, how modified the antibiotic is compared to like penicillin itself. That's a, and that's a good question. That's why, you know, you have some drug companies that are constantly trying to, um, at, at some point, these drugs become semi-synthetic because they're no longer, they don't, they sort of resemble the natural compound, but not really anymore. So yeah, that's a good point. Um, gonorrhea is the second most common notifiable disease in the United States. Chlamydia is first. So the sexually transmitted infections are, tend to be pretty common. Um, these are the most recent data that the CDC has published. 710,000 reported cases in 2021. That is an increase from 2020. And you might think, well, now people are getting outside because COVID was, well, 2020 had higher numbers than 2019. So COVID didn't really stop people. It didn't stop gonorrhea anyway. It's estimated that there are over 100 million cases uh, annually worldwide. The highest rates of infection we tend to see in ethnic and racial minorities, for whatever reason, um, and also in the southeastern United States. I know the reason. The reason is um, you just tend to see a lot of sexually transmitted infections in, in areas or in communities where there's not a lot of sex ed, sex ed or comprehensive sex ed. If sex ed consists of don't have sex, um, you're gonna have high rates of gonorrhea. If it's a little bit more comprehensive, uh, you tend to see lower rates. There's one, I can't remember if it was, I think it's chlamydia. There was a huge outbreak of chlamydia at a high school in Texas and everybody was like, duh. Okay. Education is super important um, and you can't, stigmatize people who have sexually transmitted infections. You have to just treat it, it's an infection. Let's treat it, make it better. Here's how you can prevent it next time. So um, people 
can tend to be very embarrassed when they have sexually transmitted infections, which is why we also try to call them infections, not diseases. Disease has more of a stigma, like, oh, you have a disease. Oh, I have an infection, right? I can go get treated, no big deal. So it's really important that if you are working in a setting where you might encounter people who have sexually transmitted infections that you just, without judgment, educate them um, and help get them treated so that they don't pass it on anymore. Um, women have a higher risk of encountering the infection from one sexual encounter. This implies uh, in heterosexual sex. So a woman who's having sex with a man, if the man is infected, there's a 50% risk that she will acquire the infection from that encounter. If a man is having sex with an infected woman, it's an approximate 20% chance that he will acquire the infection from her. Okay, if we're talking about men who have sex with men, the rate can go higher. Women who have sex with women, the rate is lower. Okay, so those, those are the numbers that we tend to see. The trouble is asymptomatic carriers can be the biggest transmitters. And, you know, if you don't know you have a sexually transmitted infection, how are you going to be treated for it? You are not. Um, and so you will likely continue to engage in sexual behavior. And if you're having untreated sex, and that's how you got gonorrhea, you don't know you have gonorrhea, you continue to have unprotected sex, it spreads. So I told you that we see it a lot higher incidence in the southeast. Um, so the darker the county, right, the more, the more gonorrhea there is. Okay. There's us. We're not as dark. So when I teach in Fresno, I'm always like, look, there we are. Fresno, ten, Fresno County tends to have higher rates of sexually transmitted infections than some of the other counties in California. So we're hovering right here at this uh, so per 100,000 people within Stanislaus County in 2021, between 105 and 212 per 100,000 um, had, were diagnosed with gonorrhea. Okay. So in males, the infection is, tends to be uh, restricted to the urethra. It's not as common in males that it will progress all the way up their respiratory a reproductive tract like it does in females. Males will experience discharge, which is what's shown in the image here, um, and they will also have painful urination. Remember, in males, the reproductive tract and the urinary tract are the same. So you would tend to have more of a painful urination in males. Females may not always have painful urination because they are separate, the reproductive tract and the urinary tract. It can lead to further complications. It's less common, but it can um, affect the epididymis or even the prostate. Now, in women, we can have painful urination. It's not always as common. Um, there will also be discharge. However, women might sometimes experience abdominal pain. And this is because the infection tends to be higher up. So for example, in the cervix. So you're having, you know, it, it hurts in here. So in the, in the abdomen. Now, in untreated women, it can ascend the reproductive tract. You remember on the slide where we talked about virulence factors, we saw that it can like bind the fallopian tubes and it causes a condition called pelvic inflammatory disease. And that's in 10 to 20% of patients. Um, pelvic inflammatory disease causes inflammation in the reproductive organs. It can lead to scarring and infertility. Um, so like scarring in the fallopian tubes can prevent fertilization or if fertilization does occur, it can prevent uh, the zygote from being able to implant in the uterus. And so you can have ectopic, ectopic pregnancies that would result. So this can um, lead, to, lead to significant infertility. Okay. Um, in women because it does tend to progress up and through the body more than it does in men. It can also go into the bloodstream and cause septic infections and it can cause joint infections. So it can cause arthritis um, in women. It's, it's rare, that's a rare complication. 
but it does that more frequently in women than it does in men, even if both are left untreated for the exact same amount of time. And so because it can cause joint infection, this is actually one of the leading causes of what we call purulent arthritis. There's an active infection um, and associated with like pus and bacteria in the joint itself in adults. So it's the leading cause in adults. If a newborn uh, is born to a mother who has gonorrhea, there can be ocular complications. So it can cause infections in the eye. We tend not to see eye infections in adults. Uh, generally in children, and so you'll have a purulent discharge in the eye of the newborn. Okay. And it can cause anorectal infections and pharyngitis. Okay, so sexual contact, different kinds of sexual contact can lead to transmission to other areas of the body. But generally, ocular is, is only in newborns who've been born to a mother with gonorrhea. So this is a case study of gonorrhea arthritis. Uh, six patients, including the following patient who has a typical presentation. A 17-year-old girl was admitted to the hospital with a four-day history. Here's what I found. Thank you. Of fever, chills, tiredness, sore throat, skin rash, and basically pain in multiple joints, arthritis in multiple joints. She reported being sexually active and having a five week history of a profuse yellowish vaginal discharge that was untreated. So again, in your technically pediatric patients, what do you, you expect a 17, most 17 year old kids are not gonna, mom, okay, I need to go to the doctor because I'm having this issue, right? They tend to hide it. So in kids, this, this can be really complicated, um, but a lot of people would be embarrassed to go to the doctor and be like, hi, look at this problem I'm having. So you have to be really compassionate. Upon presentation, she had red skin lesions all over her forearm, thigh, and ankle. Um, her like finger joints, wrist, knee, ankle were acutely inflamed, elevated white blood cell count, cultures of the cervix were positive for gonorrhea, blood specimens, exudate of the skin lesions, and joint fluid were all sterile. Uh, the diagnosis of disseminated gonorrhea with polyarthritis was made and she was successfully treated with penicillin G, which is not exactly the same as penicillin, it's a modified form, for two weeks. This case illustrates the limitations of culture in disseminated infections um, and the value of careful cardiac history. You don't need a ton of bacteria in order to cause the symptoms. So that's why you can't always culture the bacteria from the area. Oops, best diagnosis, gram stain of discharge. Gram-negative diplococcus. Um, you can do nucleic acid tests, and of course, yes, it can be cultured. Typically, we don't recommend penicillins as treatment. We are seeing a lot of um, increased antibiotic resistance in gonorrhea, so combined antibiotic therapy is generally recommended. Um, and there is no vaccine available. So why, why do you think that might be? Why would we not develop a vaccine for the, literally the second most common infection in the US? It has to do with how good it is at changing its surface proteins and hiding from the immune system. If the immune system can't recognize it, how can you design a vaccine? Because the vaccine is supposed to tell your immune system how to recognize it. So because it's so good at hiding, it can be very difficult to design a vaccine. So of course, what we always recommend is prevention. Prevention is the best medicine. And since we can't prevent with a vaccine, uh, safe sexual practices, um, because people can be asymptomatic, frequent um, STI panels to get, you know, get tested, especially if you're with a new partner. Very romantic date, but, but go, go on that date. First date, went well, second, third, fourth, whatever, no judgment, whatever date you want to go on, make it a date before sexual activity. So the CDC considers drug-resistant Neisseria gonorrhea to be their, one of their highest levels of concern. So um, these numbers are estimates. So 
when I gave you that number of like 710, that's the official number that were diagnosed. It's estimated that actually there's probably well over a million cases per year, but not everybody knows, not everybody gets treated. So 710,000 are the people who got reported because they got treated. Um, and it's estimated that of all the infections, at least half of them are drug resistant. Um, increased medical costs. It can result in life-threatening ectopic pregnancy and infertility. Um, and it can also increase the risk of getting and giving HIV because it can cause lesions. Okay, and then I thought this, this I don't know why this headline made me laugh. So gonorrhea, back in the day, they would call it the clap. So if you're, the clap is gonorrhea. I don't know why, but then this headline made me laugh. Is anyone clapping for super gonorrhea? So are you clapping for the clap? Uh, so sexually transmitted disease becoming resistant to treatment. Um, anyone who is sexually active can get gonorrhea. And again, this is old, right? Maybe 800,000 per year. So it's probably well over a million, but how many people turn up and get diagnosed? So anyone who is sexually active can get gonorrhea. Fun. We'll pick up on Monday with Neisseria meningitidis. Uh, make sure you turn in your sheet uh, with your name on it, uh, that you were here today and participated in our activity. If you have your exam that you want me to reevaluate, make sure you turn that in with the corrections before you leave. Uh, any questions, comments, and concerns, let me know. Shoot me an email. Otherwise, have a really great weekend.